This is Richard Lynch. I'm the partner in charge of Sickage's not-for-profit and higher education practice. Um, I appreciate everyone taking the time to log into best practices for fiduciary oversight over the 403B plan. I'm sure that you will find the content uh, very timely and very valuable. Um, before we jump in and begin, I have a few housekeeping items that we need to take care of. The slides that we'll be going through today are available in the handout section of your GoToWebinar panel. This webinar is accredited for CPE and HRCI credits. HRCI activity ID and information is located in the handout section of your GoToWebinar panel. If you are seeking CPE credit, there will be three polling questions throughout the presentation as well as an evaluation at the conclusion of the webinar that you'll need to complete. Uh, please keep in mind the polling questions. You do not have to answer them accurately. You just need to respond to them um, to mark your attendance. The webinar will be recorded for your reference for future uh, uh, referring back to uh, at any point of interest. Please submit any questions during the presentation using the question area on the, your GoToWebinar panel. Um, with that, I want to introduce to you Karen Sanchez, who is a CPA. She's a partner in charge of the Sickiches Employee Benefit Plan and Services team. She oversees the Employee Benefit Plan audit as well as the compliance and consulting services for retirement and welfare benefit plans in a variety of industries, including um, the higher education market. And Bill Karsten, he's a senior consultant with over 24 years of financial industry experience assisting financial officers and business professionals with managing and reducing risk inherent in their organizations. Uh, we bring Karen and Bill to you today um, as we've seen an evolution of issues and topics arising out of 403B audits. And in order to respond to our clients and relationships needs, we thought it would be imperative to bring some of those opportunities for best practices to your attention. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Karen and Bill. Thanks, Richard. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I listed some of the topics here that, that we're going to cover this afternoon just to give you a way of background as to kind of how we got to this point. As Richard mentioned, that you know some of these have been an emerging area with respect to 403B plans. Uh, you know, we, we saw a lot of other oversight and compliance um, issues more closely followed and, and more guidance provided within the 401k space. And so 403B plans are really just kind of evolving to sort of the oversight levels that we've seen in 401k plans in, in, in prior years. Um, we're going to also focus on the recent IRS pre-approved 403b documents. So again, mirroring what provisions had been provided in the 401k space, we're now getting you know 403b plans to really be at the same level in terms of that uh, guidance that we see in the 401k space. Uh, any presentation would, wouldn't be complete without talking about some of the IRS's um, you know, issues that they find upon audits to make sure that, you know, if you address those things in your particular plans. Uh, Bill's going to highlight um, and cover in about the second half of the presentation some of the best practices in the fiduciary oversight over, over 403B plans. You know, many years ago we didn't see um, that, that the fiduciary aspect in 403B plans, uh, particularly in the higher education space, was necessarily something that our clients th felt that there was that was their responsibility. In 2009, when we did our first audits, it was uh, we were sort of the messenger of a of a concept that they weren't ready to hear. Sometimes, in terms of explaining that they did, you know, plan sponsors have a fiduciary oversight resp responsibility with respect to their 403B plans. And then uh, Bill's also going to cover some of the recent lawsuits that have been in the higher education space that highlight some of those requirements for some of this fiduciary oversight and some of the findings on those. Uh, typically, they've been at the larger institution, but what we're seeing in the 401k space is while those started at the higher or larger organization, we are seeing them come into the smaller plan space. There was one in, in Minnesota at the $5 million uh, plan asset mark um, in recent years, not in the higher education, but you know in the 401k space. So what starts at the higher institutions is likely going to eventually you know, move in, into um, your size market, so you obviously want to be prepared on the, on the front end of that. Uh, as Richard mentioned earlier, this, this presentation is eligible for CPE credit. Um, the CPE requirements you know, require that we go through these different polling questions. So trying to keep it light and within the spirit of entering the holiday season, we're going to focus on the holiday theme of questions rather than drill you on uh, technical issues. Uh, so the first question 
is, and by the way, if you get these wrong, you still get your credit. Uh, so don't stress too much about it. Uh, so approximately how many pounds of candy corn are produced each year? Hopefully you all didn't consume this amount as we just went through the Halloween time, but uh, would you say it's 5 million, 15 million, 35 million, or 50 million? We'll give you folks a chance to put your guesses in as we um, take a look at things. All right, so uh, most folks felt it was about the 15 million mark, and it's actually 35 million, so there's some folks out there that ate even more than you guys did as you went through the holiday season. So moving on to the reason you're here, um, I always like to start with kind of where we've come from to kind of, you know, place things in terms of where we're at today. Uh, so back in 1958 is when Congress originally added the 403B provisions. Um, no, I do not remember that time frame, but, but it did happen back at that point in time. Um, you know, a, a number of years later, we actually got regulations to oversee that. Ten years later, um, ERISA, which is the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974, was put in place, and that really became the foundation of, of most of today's retirement plan rules, not only in the 403B space, but the 401K as well. And there wasn't a ton of changes over those years, but then in 2001, we had some more sweeping legislation that, that crossed over. So it took the IRS until about 2004 to really come out with the proposed 403B regulations to provide oversight as to all the things that your plans have been operating under over, over a number of years. Um, then it took three more years before the IRS actually finalized those proposed regulations. And those of you who were involved during that period of time you know, might remember there was a lot of back and forth over that uh, period of time in terms of what those rules might look like. And then those final regulations actually went into place um, two years after that. So they gave you a two-year period once those were finalized uh, before they had to take effect. Um, in 2009 is when that plan document uh, requirement to be in writing was first imposed. And then along with that, while you might have been filing a 5500 for your plan in prior years, the um, it, was, it was a skeleton really of a, of a 5500. It was basically your plan information. And that expanded into the full uh, filing requirement of, of most plans at that point in time, including imposing the audit requirement. So You've had written plan documents since 2009, and really during that time frame, we haven't had a lot of guidance, again, in terms of exactly what needed to be in there. So earlier this year, in 2017, we did have the IRS came out with those first approval of some written language. So now we've got some guidance as to what, you know, all those years ago should have been in your plan documents. wanted to take a, a moment to uh, talk about the ERISA requirement element of that before we jump into some of the, the plan document issues. Um, most 403B plans um, are subject to ERISA. Back in the pre-2009 era, we spent a lot of time kind of working with clients to help them understand if they were subject to ERISA. Um, if you have no employer contributions, there were some opportunities to evaluate whether or not you're actually subject to ERISA. And if there's any kind of employer involvement, including even approving distributions or loans, that typically you know, threw you into the world of being subject to ERISA. So today, I think most of our plan sponsors are, are viewing that they are subject to ERISA. I did provide a couple of um, regulatory references here that, that provide pretty good detail in terms of when you might not be subject to ERISA. There are certain, you know, variety of different types of dif different tax or exempt organizations out there. Um, so governmental entities are always exempt from ERISA. It's always interesting that the governmental entities, you know, don't subject themselves to the same rules that they wrote for everybody else. But it is what it is. Um, churches are generally exempt from ERISA, although they have the opportunity to elect to be subject to ERISA. Um, and then church-controlled organizations are also exempt, and that was recently. Uh, ratified by this U.S. Supreme Court decision to continue to support that. So uh, certain um, church-controlled organizations might be some of the private colleges that are controlled by the church or a lot of different medical um, our hospitals and clinics and medical systems um, are affiliated with the church and they've felt they're under the protections of that church exemption and therefore not subject to ERISA. It is really important to know if you're subject to it or not in order to make sure you're complying with the set of rules 
you know, under ERISA, you know, just missing a 5500 filing that you'd be required to under ERISA can be very costly if it's later determined you were subject to a lot of those different requirements. Um, you know, we have a variety of different types of entities with sometimes uh, on the phone here today, so I wanted to just make sure that if, if anybody on the line is related to a government plan that as we go through some of these things you realize some of these limits you're not subject to. Similarly, church plans, as I said, are, are really not subject to most of these requirements. But for the rest of you that don't fall under that category, you really will be subject to the, a lot of these different code sections and limits that, that we'll cover here today. So if, if we are, most of you are probably subject to ERISA as a part of this, um, this discussion. So this just outlines some of the types of areas that that are applicable to your organization then you have to have certain vesting schedules that that are set out by those criteria you should be filing the 5500 and, and for those organizations 100 and up you need to have the audit done you get to have your friendly auditor out every year I know you guys love seeing us every year um, and so you also have to provide your employees with a summary plan description summary and a report and a variety of other things including making sure you're your employee contributions are deposited timely, including your loan payments, you know, things of that nature. Just really quick, Erin, I know for, for a lot of our clients that are on the line, can you speak really quickly to the summary annual report? Oh, sure. So the when the 5500 gets prepared, um, those of you who are familiar with that process, it provides, you know, some financial information. It provides how many participant counts there are. You know, it's probably 10 pages long, et cetera, in the, you know, lovely IRS government format of everything. And so the summary in the report is really an excerpt, a one, generally a one or two page excerpt of the data that was in the 5500. And it's meant to be in a summarized, easy to follow version that would go out to the plan participants. So typically whoever prepares your 5500 would also draft the summary in your report because it's really an extract of that, but then ultimately it's the plan sponsor's responsibility to understand if they need to distribute it or if they may have engaged their record keeper to distribute it. A lot of them will will handle the actual mailing or, or distribution of that in accordance with, they might do your fee disclosure, sending that out to participants, but it is important to know that all these requirements to you as a plan sponsor, it's your responsibility and maybe you've engaged someone else to do that, but until ultimately you have to make sure that it gets done, but that's a great question. So continuing on, so there actually are advantages of being subject to risk. I know it's a list of things that may not be your favorite things to deal with, but being subject to ERISA allows you some of the protections that if you meet some of these best practices that Bill will talk about later, that it actually provides some safeguards for employers um, and that if you do certain things that it makes sure that you are not subject to um, you know, litigation in certain areas and things of that nature. If you're not subject to ERISA, and some of the reasons why folks, um, some you know, church organizations, for example, might want to elect to be, is that you're not then subject to state laws, which could differ from one to the other. And, and ERISA attorneys often tell me that there's more advantageous federal laws in some states than than you know, certain states may provide. So it's more, it's more of a sure thing, if you will, what rules you're subject to, and oftentimes folks follow some of the ERISA best practices when they're not subject to them um, to try to set some of that other you know, processes in place for them. So moving on to the plan document area, then I mentioned before that back in 2009 was the first time that many of you may remember the fun of adopting your plan document when we did audits for that first 2009 plan year, we ran into a lot of circumstances where, you know, believe it or not, we actually read those documents <laughs> to figure out our roadmap for, you know, how the plan should operate. And in many cases, we found that there was a difference between the language and the document and what plan sponsors were actually operating under. And in many cases, they would go back to their prior documentation, which was absolutely correct. But when this mapping over happened onto the new form, something got changed and they may may have you know you're, you're wearing a lot of hats and have a lot of other things you know on your schedule and so not everyone had the opportunity to go through and read every provision to make sure that it accurately reflected what their actual operations were so as we go into this next phase um, of the process that's going to be very critical to make sure that things are mapped over to the next version so kind of going back to where we were at in 2009, that was the first time that you had the written plan document. And the IRS, you know, we, 
folks that drafted those documents for us kind of took a stab at what they thought the language should be, but we didn't have really, the IRS didn't come forth and say exactly what they wanted to have within that document. So we operated under what they refer to as this good faith compliance standard. You do the best you can because you don't have absolute guidance in a number of areas. And so the IRS said that was all fine for 2009. Once we got to 2010, the IRS called what they said this re um, remedial amendment period, meaning that, again, document the best you can, but you're going to have an opportunity to sort of retroactively put this language in place once it's been approved. So here we are seven years later, and now we have that language you know, to go back in time and do. Um, so in 2013, the IRS came out with the parameters of that pre-approved language program, um, and then we are just now getting some of these opinion letters. Um, so, so the way the process works is that, um, so for example, Sickage contracted with another vendor who that vendor, dra you know, their attorneys draft all the language in these adopt and adoption agreements. So you'll see all those boxes you choose for different options within your plan of how you want to, you know, what, how, what you want to have as your waiting period for employer contributions or distributions or loans or whatever. Um, and then there's also the you know longer document that has all the legal information in it. We send that in, and, and the IRS gives what's called an opinion letter. So they say that the form of the options you get to choose and the language that's in there upon audit, they're not going to change that, and they're not going to challenge that. They can't penalize you because they want to have a provision in there later. So you get a lot of protections that at least the form of your plan is established in accordance with the appropriate regulations. The only thing they can get you on is that your operations did not match you know, the legal document. Uh, I shouldn't say the only thing. I'm sure there's something else, but in general, the form of your plan is fine and you, your issues would generally be with respect to the operations of the plan. The IRS does not issue what, what would be a formal determination letter, so that would be if ABC organization wants to specifically apply and have a letter that has their name on it. These letters that you're going to see are going to be that of your service provider. So, for example, Sickage sent in our application years ago, have our letter, and it's going to say the Sickage LLP um, 403P document approval letter that our clients would be operating under um, in that arena. So timing is you know, always important to note that while those letters got approved uh, earlier this spring for the most plans, the IRS gives us a three-year uh, period in which to update the documents. So there's a lot of guidance still coming out from our document vendors um, on the ins and outs of, of how to complete these forms. I mean, our new checklist is 44 pages long, so our team's been going to training to understand exactly what those provisions mean. So I think you'll be seeing from your vendors um, information on what that restatement process will be in the coming years. And, and I was just going to add, I, I can give you an update hot off the presses, a memo I got today from TIAA because I know a lot of the people who are, are joining us today have TIAA as a record keeper. Uh, they just indicated they will not be able to distribute that document for client review until next year and they've just pegged a rough uh, date for starting implementations of mid-2018. Uh, Again, recognizing that deadline that uh, that's up on the page there is that the key is to transition over by the end of March 2020. Right, and it would be important to note that I, I think that most of our our TIA plans are using the TIA document, but just making sure that you are on the list with them and that they are taking that responsibility. Um, and some of you may not be using TIA Craft, or you may even have. You know, we've got some plans that have assets at an outside organization, or maybe TIA is. Um, one of the custodians, but that's not your active custodian. So you have one plan document over the entire umbrella of your 403B plan. So you need to make sure that whatever vendors, any of those custodians are both addressed um, under that overall umbrella of the plan. So there are going to be one of the things you want to take a look at within the plan. One of the first pages that you'll see on there is going to be that what's the effective date of the plan going to be, that it's um, uh, relative to, you know, I mentioned earlier that 2010 plan year that, you know, that's when, when the IRS is going to care about what the uh, effective date of some of these provisions are where you no longer had these issues of reliance. Um, and so you'll have the opportunity within those documents to really say that this document is effective as of the first day of the 2010 plan year, for example. And if you list the 2010 date in there, then you can have this retroactive re 
lions back to that point in time. Rather than just saying it's going to be, if, if TIA comes out with your documents mid-2018, chances are the first you'll really be adopting them if you're on a calendar your plan is going to be the beginning of 2019. Mm -hmm. Typically you like to, we like to have those dated the first day of a plan year so that you know, it also gives you an opportunity if you want to make some changes or enhancements that some of these things are going to be things you're going to be adding on a prospective basis rather than you know, retroactively documenting what you did. So you have two things happening, you know, accurately documenting everything you did in the past and then looking forward to potentially what enhancements you may want to make going forward. No, I think that's an excellent point. Now is a good time to review your plan document and start that discussion point. If there's anything that you may want to change about your plan, it would be beneficial to do that all at once as you transition to a different document. Yeah, this is your chance for cleanup. <laughs> this exactly. is your chance to uh, right the wrongs of maybe the past that might not have been exactly correct and your your chance to kind of come clean with all those different things and making sure you've got a good document in place going forward. Once we go into this, um, get to that 2020 date, uh, you know, that's sort of the end of the line in terms of this uh, kinder, gentler IRS giving you a chance to kind of update things from there on out. You know, it's a little bit more challenging to to make some document changes, and it might require going to the IRS for approval to make corrections of your document retroactively and things like that. So we've got a window now, so take advantage of of the time frame that we have, which is why we wanted to kind of get in front of you guys early um, and make you aware of some of these things that are coming down the road. 2020 will be here before we know it, unfortunately. Um, so make sure that you kind of know what, what's coming down the, the line here. Uh, so anyway, in this plan document, similar to the document you have right now, it's going to have to include all material terms of the plan. So it's going to walk through all the different operational aspects like eligibility, limitations on a number of areas. Some of these might be IRS rules. Um, some of these are going to be things that you choose how you want your plan to operate, uh, making sure that if you offer loans or don't offer them, that's included. You know, we saw, you know, different vendors, maybe they say, well, this one offers loans and this one doesn't. Well, all that's going to have to be, you know, clearly outlined in the plan document what is, is available for your participants. Um, you know, you might, you're likely going to have an appendix in your plan uh, outlining some administrative functions. So from an operational standpoint, you get to choose how you operate certain things that isn't just really a legal part of the plan, but it gives a way to communicate to your participants how you do certain things, like maybe how often, you know, you allow changes in a certain area or things like that that aren't necessarily a legal aspect. Um, and then you also might have an appendix that's going to list all the investment vendors. I mentioned before sort of the evolution in 403B plans that we saw is that sometimes maybe not as much in the higher education because it, it truly does feel like TIA's got the, the market on, you know, most of the higher education plans out there. But we have seen some movement to different vendors as they've been evaluating fees, et cetera. And, you know, now that might be it, you know, a particular vendor plus a TIA craft and there's multiple ones out there. So, Again, the plan document is the umbrella for the structure of the plan, and we need to make sure you incorporate any different even legacy contracts. If you had different um, individual count contracts prior to moving, you want to just make sure all those things are, are covered in the document. The plan document is going to be the controlling instrument. So, you know, folks like, like Bill's involvement from your investment perspective is going to be critical because you're going to want to understand what is in those investment contracts and make sure that you don't have conflicting provisions, for example, you know, distribution restrictions or what they're allowing for and loans, things like that. We often see contradictory provisions or maybe one contract, you know, if you're using two different pro providers, we've got some of our some clients might have four different providers and they all had different provisions in these annuity contracts and there were individual annuity contracts and you can't get out of those and you know a whole number of things can can create a lot of confusion here and so you know this is again to Bill's point a great time to start now make sure you understand exactly what's in those uh, custodial uh, agreements because you're going to want to make sure that is all clearly listed out and I don't know that those investment providers often let you change the provisions of, of some of those things. And so you just want to make sure that, that everything is in sync. And again, the plan document's going to conflict with the investment account. I'm not sure how. That'll be the risk attorneys of the world to help us figure I out what, what happens. I was just going to say, if, if you haven't convinced people to uh, consult an ERISA attorney yet. Uh, this will do it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so um, this sounds really elementary, but... The, really the most critical thing here is that when you get that new document, you really need to read through that 
um, and understand what each of those plan provisions is doing. I've got to believe TIACREP is usually really good about doing some educational rollout. So I'm guessing in 2018, once they roll that out, they're going to have some educational opportunities for for their um, clients. So I encourage you to take advantage of those um, to make sure you understand exactly what is in the plan. There's a lot of provisions that are going to be added in this document that I know we didn't see in our prior document. Ours often didn't, you know, reference certain distribution rules, whereas the new one does. You know, it's about 44 pages long, so there's a lot of questions that are in there and a lot of opportunities for things to not be listed quite right and, you know, misunderstandings. So this will give you an opportunity to take a fresh look at how you're operating and make sure that it's consistent with that. I listed some of the common areas that that we've seen on audits or areas to have special focus on when you are taking a look at those new documents. Uh, particularly in the higher education space, one area we've run into is uh, many of, of our clients are, are very generous in terms of crediting some prior service with other institutions. So you leave one college and you come to another, you want to allow them immediate eligibility, um, not only to the salary deferrals, which they already have, but into the employer contributions. And sometimes, unknowingly, they may not be uh, properly obtaining the right information in order to provide the, the proper crediting, um, hours of service. I mean, it's kind of an administrative headache, if you will, to try to gather that data and then administer this area properly. Yeah, and just one thing I wanted to add that's come up with a couple of our clients is, you know, you, you'll want to make sure in your plan document that it, it identifies whose responsibility it is in terms of identifying that eligibility so that you, know, you don't find yourself in a position where someone should have qualified but they didn't properly identify that and four years after they're hired they're coming into the HR office and saying hey wait I should get credit for that first year or two because I had or, you know, I, I did qualify for the waiver. Yeah we've had a number of clients that have had to go back in time and reconstruct this and it they're hiring university counsel they're doing a lot of administrative calculations and they're paying in some money that they wouldn't have otherwise um, planned on, on sending in in this area so De definitely an area to, to re take a re fresh look at and make sure that that you're meeting all the current criteria of that document and it, you know if nothing else this gives you an opportunity to reevaluate what do you want to what do you want to be when you grow up and next year with your plan and kind of going into that next phase of things kind of you know you have to do the document anyway so take it as an opportunity to refresh any particular provisions of your plan that you may have been thinking about but hadn't necessarily you know risen to the top of the list I would always look at the definition of compensation very clearly. Again, it sounds very simple, but there's so many different things that you can choose to include or exclude. Um, you know, you might start with gross compensation, and we've, I've never, I didn't realize how many different types of compensation they could have. I've had some clients that literally have wedding gifts as a, you know, type of category, and, you know, I, I, I'll never say I've heard it all, because there's usually some other interesting co compensation code that, that seems to get put in there. So it's a great time to kind of look at your system and see, you know, what does your system provide for and any deviations really from gross wages you need to make sure that are, are addressed in the document. Participant loans are another area, particularly on our on the TIA plans, you had all those plan loans out there and then you get the participant loans and so making sure that that's consistent with how you plan on administering the plan. Uh, and eligibility for employer contributions, again, you know, it's crediting service is an issue, but also just making sure, again, you understand exactly when they become eligible and flipping the switch that they're getting those at the appropriate time. And the distribution rules is another one to make sure that, you know, it's laid out. You know, it sounds very simple, but then how does that coincide, again, going back to those custodial agreements and making sure that you're not overriding rules that can't be administered, um, you know, within the investment contracts that you have in place. So universe availability is an area that, that we do see some issues with as, as well. So the concept is that under the 403B plans, um, generally all employees that are, that are um, you know, earning at least $200 a year have to be allowed to immediately contribute. So you would expect that most of your folks would you know, be earning at that level. So they're in day one and immediately eligible. So you want to make sure that your onboarding process is providing them that, that information so that they can come into the plan effectively that first day of payroll should they so elect. Um, and so you want to make sure that you've got are meeting the requirements relative to giving them the notices that they need in order to make those elections and the, the appropriate time frame to make those elections as well. Um, you can have certain groups excluded from the plan. Um, so I've lifted, listed some of the things out here. So some, a lot of times in the higher education, we might see students excluded, or you can have those employees that normally work 
fewer than 20 hours a week. Um, and but again, you got to make sure that those things are documented in your plan, and that you're not, to, you know, that you're operating in accordance with the rules that are laid out. We've seen some people get in trouble with that 20 hours a week, which is kind of a thousand hours a year um, in terms of how they are calculated. And then, you know, our employees don't always do what we think they're going to do when they originally sign up. You know, there's change in status and things of that nature. And so we want to make sure that you're continuing to monitor the status of employees if you are carving out people um, that then, you know, change their status, work a different number of hours, et cetera. And, you know, sometimes with adjunct professors, you don't know. You know, you're not calculating hours. It's it's project based things like that. Well, I was going to say, in addition to you, you highlighted the definition of compensation as a concern point. Uh, we would also argue that thousand hour rule. That that's something to really be careful about in your plan because you may have some part time employees who weren't intended to work a thousand hours, but then all of a sudden one year they do, and you want to make sure that you're handling them properly relative to. Uh, employer contributions and matching contributions from that date going forward. Right. And I think one of the things our our document vendor highlighted is that I think there's a shift in some of the language here too in terms of now that IRS is saying that after the first year you can exclude only if the employee worked a thousand hours in any previous year. So to your point, once you've done that once, a thousand and one hours, now you're in. Mm -hmm. um, so you've crossed into the uh, the new world of things. So contributions, uh, most of you are probably familiar with the dollar limitations. I did list out that the IRS recently issued the 2018 limits here, so we did see a slight increase in the salary deferrals under the 402G limit up to the 18.5. So, and then the catch-up limits are in here as well, as well as the overall limits. There are a couple of, um, there's two different types of catch-ups actually for the 403B plans. One is the age 50 that I mentioned before with the $6,000. So folks can defer over their regular limit uh, by the extra $6,000 if they're age 50 or older sometime during the calendar year. But qualified organizations, those of you on the phone today, um, can also have an employee that has at least 15 years of service qualify for additional contributions. And this is something that has to be included in the plan document. I gave you the formula here. So in some, uh, some cases, we do see folks that are eligible to put amounts in even above that normal 24000 that we wouldn't expect. That always throws our staff off to go, wait, how can they have any more than $24,000 you know, in a particular year? But in these instances, you can allow for that. It does require some bookkeeping to kind of track through that, and I think Tia does a pretty good job for clients on that. But ultimately, you want to make sure you're reviewing those calculations to make sure that that it's flowing through, um, and that the information you're giving them, you know, is is appropriate for that purpose. So the IRS is out there to help you with compliance via the audit process to ensure that that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and they'll, they'll come assist you with that if, if need be. Um, so these are the issues. I actually took these off the IRS website as to terms of the top IRS problems that they're finding upon audits. Uh, so some in some cases, they're seeing that 403B uh, plan participants are exceeding those dollar contributions that I mentioned earlier, so the $18,000. Um, even with catch-ups, they're still exceeding some of those limits. And that obviously has tax consequences to the participant. Um, you know, more so because actually they get double taxed if they go over the limit and it's not corrected timely. So that's sort of an employee relations nightmare when those things go wrong. So you want to take, make sure that those have some safeguards in place to um, ensure that doesn't happen. Uh, the universal availability concept that I mentioned earlier um, is not always being applied right. Eligibility is not being offered initially eligible or excluded categories that shouldn't be there. Um, folks going over that what we call 415 contributions, that overall limit of the 54,000, we see that happening sometimes. Uh, plans not following the loan rules that are out there. Uh, hardship distributions, making sure that the appropriate documentation of the support that the reason for the hardship was maintained, uh, particularly when you got multiple vendors in, uh, involved, to make sure that you've got that uh, lined up. Um, again, number six, the just not appropriate documentation for this unforeseeable emergency distributions that are out there in 457 plans. Again, those of you that have any 457F plans as well, um, making sure that you're meeting all the requirements in those um, kind of non-qualified plans, if you will, for some of your executives. Um, eight is really along the same lines of the 457F plans. Uh, but going back to the 403B plans, they are seeing a lot of annuity contract problems, not having the appropriate uh, 
cross over in terms of those provisions. Um, so keep that in mind. And then lastly, um, ineligible plan sponsors. So obviously that probably doesn't apply to most of you on the call today, assuming you're, you are uh, higher education institutions, but that is still out there. We have run a few, across a few of those over the years where um, you know the right, wrong type of organization adopted these certain plans. So um, our next polling question, oops, let me go back a minute, is going to be a uh, true or false question. Uh, Thanksgiving Day is celebrated on the fourth Thursday in November in the United States. Uh, so again, true or false, we'll give you a minute to respond there. Let your brains catch up a little bit with all the content we just went through. <laughs> So, a hundred percent of you did know that the, yeah, uh, the, the, the yeah everybody knows that Thanksgiving is coming up shortly, and your families will be expecting you there on the appropriate day. So, um, so we're gonna I'm gonna turn it over now to to Bill to talk about some of the fiduciary um, oversight considerations. Well, I'll start out with the 15 second version of the presentation, and and that would focus on process and documentation. Now, your key is, is to establish and follow defined processes and to document your discussions and your decisions. That, that's really your uh, best defense uh, against claims, which we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on and certainly we'll, we'll expand on this. But uh, just wanted to emphasize those words, process and documentation. Uh, so moving on, uh, who is a fiduciary? Uh, you know, by title, you know, some people based on your, your own governance documents, are, you're naming who your fiduciaries are, but recognize it's a status that's, that's based on actions uh, as well. So, you know, anybody who's interpreting plan documents, anyone who's giving advice relative to the plan is a fiduciary, whether specifically named or not. Um, as for those who may not be serving in a fiduciary capacity, uh, your record keeper in their administrative capacity will shy away from fiduciary responsibility. There may be an exception with regard to your record keeper providing uh, advice services to participants on your campus, uh, but otherwise they, they would be acting in a non-fiduciary capacity. Uh, as far as, as your advisors or consultants of the plan, certainly you want to make sure you have that spelled out in writing in terms of their fiduciary role and, and ensure that they are acting as a fiduciary to your plan. And then uh, one additional point here, you know, those who are, are responsible for delegating fiduciary authority are themselves fiduciaries and maintain that responsibility in terms of the selection and oversight of those who are, are assigned as, as additional fiduciaries on the plan. A uh, quick note on non-ERISA or church plans. So, make a couple of points here. Uh, first and foremost, we strongly recommend that you have a legal opinion on file to support your non-ERISA status. And second, we would note that you are can feel free to follow ERISA guidance without the danger of subjecting yourself to being classified as an ERISA plan. And, in, and on this page here, we, we identify specific guidance that, that was issued by the IRS in that regard. But just be careful to separate out ERISA versus IRS. Uh, getting back to process and documentation, understand that you can only be held responsible for making decisions based on information that is available at the time of the decision. So, you know, going in through that process, certainly you want to pull in all uh, relevant information. You want to show and document those discussions you had and decisions, but if information changes afterwards, that cannot be used against you in terms of the decision you made at a prior date. With that said, there's that initial decision and then there's the monitoring of decisions you've made. You still maintain that monitoring responsibility, so as additional information comes across, you can't simply ignore that and say, well, we already made the decision and, and so we're just going to stick to it based on the information available then. You do have to continue to review decisions you've made in light of new information that becomes available to you. Uh, as far as uh, processes and, and just the things you want to have in place, uh, the, the three items that we bullet point here, they're not required, 
However, you know, what we read again and again and hear again and again is in, in the event of a, a DOL audit, fiduciary training, investment policy statement, and mini, min, eh, meeting minutes are three of the most common things I'll initially ask for. And it really is just giving that initial uh, idea of whether or not you do have these processes in place or you know, in, in the absence of those items that may serve as a red flag. Uh, speaking to meeting minutes, do's and don'ts, uh, really the key factors to, to having your minutes are what was considered, key factors that drove any decisions, and that what specifically was approved uh, without having to record an exact vote. And in fact, we recommend you don't do that. You know, you don't, you don't want to show dissenters. It's just important to say the committee just, you know, looked at this information, discussed it, and it was approved. And uh, you know, getting into what not to include, um, you know, it, obviously you don't need to put in every detail of a discussion. And uh, you know, for example, you wouldn't want to say that you know Susan disagreed with Bob's comment and therefore she voted against this. You know, right there, you've documented something that could be used. You know, it's something that's discoverable and could be used against you uh, in a future claim. Key fiduciary concepts, right here, these two items are, are really, these, these are ERISA concepts are at the core of our fiduciary training for uh, new fiduciaries to a plan or, or to committee members. Uh, the exclusive benefit rule basically speaks to acting in the best interest of participants. Now there may be times uh, while you're serving on a committee where you, you have to step aside from your fiduciary role and we'll talk a little bit about that but in general you always want to be acting in the best interest of participants and and then the prudent person rule uh, this was established by ERISA many many years ago they actually call it the prudent man rule but basically what it says is it held, holds you uh, to uh, the standard of an expert you know someone who's familiar with plan matters uh, that, that's why you have an auditor for your plan, that's why you engage ERISA counsel, that's why you have a record keeping provider and why we would encourage you to have a, a consultant on your plan as well because you are held to this standard. So fiduciaries are also required to diversify investments. Um, and let's separate out here a pension plan versus defined contribution plan. Today we're speaking to defined contribution plans. So what this really says is you need to offer appropriate diversification opportunity to your plan participants in terms of the investments that you that you offer. And interestingly to this date, ERISA doesn't really say much beyond having three fully diversified options. Um, you know, obviously you want to take it further than that for, for your plan and, and typically that's you know, why you, you'll offer a life cycle or target date fund so you have that one fully diversified option for those less sophisticated investors and then you want to go well beyond three options in terms of those who like to build their own investment portfolio. Uh, in administering the plans in accordance with their stated terms, you know, first and foremost the plan document has to dictate Second, and that's a very important uh, point, unless you're just 100% sure that you can interpret that on your own, go to ERISA counsel. We've had many times where, you know, the way a document reads, you, you know, not being an expert in the law, you may interpret it one way, but it, it's always good when in doubt to get that ERISA guidance, that ERISA counsel guidance, sorry. And then uh, your best defense with investments, uh, your investment selection, again, always following a well-defined process both for your selection and for your monitoring of investments ongoing. So I promised I'd come back to those times where you have to remove your fiduciary hat and that's what we call a, a settler decision. There may be times where your institution tasks you with looking at plan design. Maybe it's because of a budget constraint uh, that, that you have to look at a, a, a way to work with less dollars and so it, you know, it might be that, that you're looking at a different employer contribution formula. That obviously would not be in the best interest of your plan participants so what you need to do is clearly identify at the meeting that we are not acting in a fiduciary capacity and then you would want to document that accordingly in your meeting minutes. 
and you know there are times you're going to have one meeting you're going to talk about fiduciary items and seller items it's very important though that you you have a delineation both in your discussion and then also that that's properly documented in your minutes and then uh, plan assets there the, the bullet point about being used for plan purposes just uh, you know many of you may have revenue credits that you use to, to pay for your audit or to pay for uh, other plan services just recognize there are certain uh, categories that don't qualify so if going back to that plan design discussion if you if you're looking to in, uh, if you're engaging a ERISA counsel for plan design changes or you're engaging a consultant for that specific topic you want to be careful to not use plan assets to pay for those services So some practical points. We already talked about the way uh, about the fact that the plan sponsor cannot delegate away the fiduciary responsibility because the oversight of service providers, oversight and monitoring, is always a responsibility that that remains. And then um, at the at the uh, bottom, we talk about a significant pain point is the oversight of plan fees, uh, especially for investment management. Uh, for plan fees, it's important that you regularly review and, and have a process in place and you document your reviews of your record keeping fees and we'll talk a little bit more about different ways to do that. And then also your fund share classes for your investments. It's important to assess those over time. Your record keeper may make more share classes available, you know, some that may be more avail uh, favorable to participants. As your plan grows and the economics change, you may be able to put in lower cost share classes and you want to show that you, you have the review process in place for that as well. So the service provider selection. What does ERISA say on this? There's no specific guideline that says you have to go out and perform uh, either a request for proposal or a request for information on your record keeping provider or other service providers every X number of years. Um, however, you know, if you have not done so, uh, you know, if you've not performed any type of an RFP or RFI for as long as you can remember, we would encourage you, you may, you may want to go to that step. Otherwise, if it's just a matter of you're, you're happy with your service provider, but you haven't taken a close look at the fees for a couple of years, you know, there are methods you can go through to to benchmark without having to go to a full RFP process. The other thing is you see fees are just one factor they're not the only factor you're not obligated to go to the lowest cost provider but rather show that the fees are reasonable relative to the services being provided so you want to measure the fees and the services together to make sure that you do have more of an apples to apples comparison. So the, the ongoing monitoring, you know, again, we, we spoke to this. It's not just about the selection, but it's, it's about also monitoring on an ongoing basis. So in addition to reviewing fees and services, you do want to show on the record that you're, you're keeping tabs on your service providers. You know, it wouldn't be a bad idea on an annual basis just to show that you had a separate discussion just to identify if there's any issues or, or concerns, and if there are, that, that those are being addressed. So the investment selection, uh, we've spoken to really to most of this already. So there's just two additional items I want to talk to here. And, and one is the investment's role in the plan's overall investment strategy. You, know, you, you want to ensure that in your menu you're avoiding participant confusion by not offering too many funds. And then you're wanting to balance that against diversification opportunity, ensuring that there aren't some critical categories that are missing investment opportunities so that those participants who build their own portfolios can be properly diversified. The other item here, target date funds, you want to show on the record that you're going deeper in that assessment because these are an all-in fund strategy. Uh, it's likely your default fund uh, for, for your plan and so you also want to show you're assessing the glide path and you know how that how the asset allocation shifts over time and what the asset allocation makeup is for your plan and that you're intentional about you know that that in your selection process some target date funds may have five or six funds within them some may have 20 or more within their strategies and so it's just important to show that that's being assessed as well
Uh, your investment policy statement, it just it's important to make sure you always build in some leeway. You know, you want to, to show there are some specific criteria that are being measured, but you don't want to predetermine what your actions will be in, in the event if there's you know, something that's not quite fit in your policy. You want to have some, some leeway there. Um, the other, the uh, independence is key, as we note at the, the bottom here. You know, in your investment review process, you know, we've seen where, where you know, there are some plan sponsors who have been relying on their record keeper to assist them in their investment oversight, with the biggest problem being is that some, some if not all, those investments are also provided by that record keeping firm. So you just want to make sure that, that you have that, that independence in your review process. So higher education lawsuits, uh, many of you may be tired already of hearing of this. Uh, on a positive note, you know, we're talking about claims. We're not talking, you know, about uh, determinations on this or, or settlements, but, you know, certainly it, there are many things that are highlighted within the claims that, that we should discuss here. Uh, a couple points that, that I want to make is, Yes, today we're seeing it's the larger institutions who have lawsuits filed against them. But over time, you know, as we see in, in any new category of lawsuits, that, that can that can come down to, to smaller plans over time. Uh, and that's why I highlight the second point is that, that you have a, a six-year statute of limitations. So don't feel like it's ever, you know, it's, it's too late to, to try to improve your processes. You want to get started on that today if you haven't already, and if you've done that a couple of years ago, you're you know you're building that clean six-year uh, window for yourself. So let's get into the specific uh, most recurring claims. This isn't a full list of claims, but I just want to identify those that, that we see in many of these lawsuits. Uh, multiple record keepers. If you're with a single record keeper, that's one you don't have to worry about. Uh, record keeping fees not being monitored properly. Offering appropriate funds, we talked a little bit about that, having the appropriate uh, share classes, and then monitoring fund performance. So I talked about that six-year statute of limitations. So you, you made a fund decision in 2010, and you say, you know, I'm good. I don't have to worry about that. That was six years ago. Well, you're okay on the selection of it, but you're still responsible for monitoring that fund. So you could still have a claim against you to say, this, this fund hasn't been properly monitored. So multiple record keepers, uh, really the, the reason this occurred for, for many institutions is because you know, up until a few years ago, uh, record keeping, many record keeping providers only offered their own funds. And in order to be able to offer a more diverse uh, set of investment options, you were forced to go to another record keeping provider. Well, now we see the momentum going in the other direction in order to drive costs back down as record keeping providers are offering other providers funds, you, many times you can consolidate back down to one record keeper without having to close out many of the funds on your menu. So there, there's really been a shift here and so it's important to show you know, that you have a, a, you've undergone a process to, if you have multiple record keepers, to identify you know, what, you know, why you would have multiple record keepers versus a single record keeper solution and which makes more sense based on investment options, cost, service, and, and other matters. It isn't to say you have to have a single record keeping provider, but you want to show you have a process in place that, that you'd identify that. Record keeping fees. Again, if, if you have not undergone a review of your fees uh, in, within the past few years, we would strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, one reason is just a lot of plans have grown significantly. We've had a, a bull market, we've had positive returns plus contributions going into the plan and also the marketplace uh, we've seen it get more competitive. So even for a similar a plan that's the same size as it was five years ago, there may be better pricing available to you. So th there's multiple ways uh, to, to go out and review your plan. You know, we talked about a, a conducting a, an RFP, but you, you can also benchmark against peers. Uh, and you can go out to databases like Brightscope and Fiduciary, but we strongly encourage you to, to, to be following at least one of those uh, methodologies. And again, if it's something you haven't done in a long time, you, you may want to go to a, to a full search. Offering appropriate funds. 
So again, just want to uh, to point out here, you know, on one hand, it's the performance of the funds in, in your selection process. You can only be held responsible, again, for the information available at the time, but you're also responsible for the ongoing monitoring with new information that becomes available. The other is the share classes. And, you know, I know in a lot of plans, there's a, the, your, your funds will have a revenue sharing component. So there's really two, two pieces here. One, you, you want, to, want to ensure you have appropriate share classes based on your plan size. And then you also want to look at fees being fair across the funds. You know, you, you could have significant differences in how much someone pays based on their investment selection under a revenue sharing model. So what we would encourage you to do is determine what's your fee policy. How do you want to collect fees to pay for record keeping services? And then look to make changes in your plan to follow that policy. The monitoring fund performance, again, you, know, you, you really want to, to, you know, you need to show that you have a prudent process in place and that you're following that process on a regular basis. And your, your investment policy statement will serve as your guide. And again, it's important to, to have specific uh, guidelines in there in terms of what you're monitoring and in terms of qualitative measures, quantitative measures, but don't make it so restrictive that you feel forced into a, a quick decision the first time the, the fund has a, an off quarter or two. You, you certainly want to establish a, a policy that gives you more leeway than that. We'll do our final polling question of the afternoon. So which country can be credited with the creation of the holiday favorite eggnog? Would you say that would be England, France, Germany, or Switzerland? I'll give you guys a moment to respond. We had a bit of a split response. Uh, a lot of folks thought it was between England and Germany. Uh, so we had a few people select all of them. The actual answer is England is credited with, with eggnog. So think about the, the British as we approach the holidays as you might be uh, celebrating with some of the eggnog. So I'll let Bill continue on here. Just final thoughts, kind of wrapping up what we discussed. I want to go back to that independence. We talked a lot about reviewing and you know reviewing fees and reviewing investments ensure that you have complete independence in, in that process uh, it, it, it would not put you in a good position if if your best defense that your record keeping fees were appropriate was that it was based on a report that was developed by your record keeping provider and, and we have seen that in cases and and the same in terms of your investment monitoring you wouldn't want that the, the process you're following was established by uh, a mutual fund company who you're carrying multiple funds on your menu from from that company. So just ensure that that you do have that independence in place for all your processes. Yeah, we've had this discussion with many clients where they show me the report that was prepared by their vendor. Everything looks awesome. And by the way, all these funds are from that same vendor, the proprietary funds of that. And then I always ask them, well, when are they going to tell you that they're overcharging you? And remember that Oftentimes that record keeper is not a fiduciary, so they do not have the obligation to act in the best interest of the plan participants. Keep in mind they are also trying to run their business. So um, having that independent review I think is, is really important um, with respect to making sure you can defend the things that you have there and that you are held to the standard of that expert with regard to that area. So if you're not using somebody externally, you're, you're expected to understand all the intricate details of those fund share classes and you know and all the other uh, nuances that might be specific to retirement plans. We often see sometimes uh, committees have outside investment expertise and so they don't you know they feel that they can certainly cover that but then the retirement plan world has all of its own nuances um, and particularly the higher education has even more with the, the, the TIA platform has some unique um, aspects to it. Um, so just obviously making sure that as you're monitoring your service providers, you're engaging with those folks that are experts in their field um, with respect to your plan. 
So I think we're we're winding down our, our time here uh, with you folks this afternoon. We did include our contact information uh, for both myself and Bill. You, you know, many of you may think of other questions after the fact, so please feel free to reach out to either one of us um, with inquiries you have. And as, as you may be starting on the plan document restatement process in the coming year, feel free to reach out. I know we'll be encouraging our clients to uh, have us review the document before they sign it so that you know, we can be part of helping them uh, adopt a, a correct document rather than, you know, after the fact, um, letting them know some, some issues that may have been arising. So, uh, again, thank you for your time this afternoon, and, and let us know if we can assist in any way. Thank you.